They taught mathematics, mathematical sciences. It was an important science. And of course, mathematics those days was slightly different from the mathematics it is at the present time. Included arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, all of these disciplines were included at the time. <coughs> they taught the philosophical sciences. Remember, philosophy is not the same as science. We call it philosophical sciences. Science, as we understand it today, is empirical. It's based upon knowledge acquired through observation. It is bottoms up. It is based upon the injunctions of the Quran. That's what the Quran teaches us. The word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Philosophy is top down. It is based upon axioms. And I'll elaborate a little bit upon that. But they taught the principles of philosophy and the principles spe specifically of Greek philosophy at the time because they had to come to terms with the thinking of the Greeks. There were so many people, especially from the Mediterranean, what is to the Syria and Egypt who had come into the fold of Islam and they brought with them their own method of looking at things, the transcendental things, as did the Persians and the Hindus, which is today's Indians and Pakistanis. So they taught philosophy and they taught tasawwuf. Tasawwuf has always been with Islamic learning, all the way going back to the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let me expand upon that too. They taught tasawwuf. They taught elocution, how to talk. If Today, for instance, our sisters, our mothers and, and grandmothers, our fathers and grandfathers, if they're concerned about educating their children, please remember the following. The two basic disciplines a child must master are elocution, that is language and mathematics. You teach a child language, you teach a child mathematics, that child, inshallah, will do well in life. So they taught elocution how to talk, how to engage in a dialectic when you have two opposite positions, how to engage in a dialectic, namely go back and forth until a higher truth emerges from the dialectic. These were some of the subjects that were taught at the time. Now let's go back a little bit and then we'll go forward. If we go back to the time of the Prophet the Prophet was from the Noor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An Nur Muhammadi. Lakad ja'akum nuru milallahi wal kitab al mubin. Behold, there has come to you the perspicuous light and a perspicuous book. The book being the Quran and the light being the light of Muhammad. And those who were trained by the Prophet, وسلم, the likes of Abu Bakr, and Omar, and Uthman, and Ali, radiallahu anhu. They, all of them, learned from the Prophet, and the Prophet gave to each one of them according to the abilities that he saw in each individual. It's not as if he gave the same thing to all of the Sahaba. That's the reason you see, for instance, as Siddiq is the truthful one. He is Siddiq. Hazrat Umar, who one of the greatest of human beings, stood for justice. Hazrat Usman was an embodiment of Haya, a, a word that cannot be translated in English language because Haya in modern language does not exist. It has disappeared in the modern world. And Hazrat Ayyub Dabanu, he was the embodiment of knowledge. The Prophet himself said, he is the doorway to my knowledge. Such was the luminaries, they reflected the light that was reflected from our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the light from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala through the Quran, to our Prophet, to the Sahaba. Then after the Sahaba, you see the Tabi'in and Tabi Tabi'in. You examine very briefly the life of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, great man he was, educated in Cairo, in opulence when he was a young man, gave all of when he became the Khalifa, <coughs> imbibing the culture, the methodology of Omar ibn al-Khattab, tried to bring about reconciliation in the community, reaching out even to those who had walked away the Kharajites. He held discussions even with the Kharajites to bring the whole community together. Reduced the taxes on the people, unfair taxes. These days, governments impose so many unfair taxes on people. Reduced the taxes on the Persians and the Egyptians. And it was during that time that the Iranians and the 
and the Egyptians became Muslim. If you plot the conversion rates in the Islamic world, it was not in the early period that, for instance, the Egyptians and the Iranians became Muslim. It was at the time of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, 720. A man who encouraged education. <coughs> Such was the grandeur of the luminaries who learned from the Sahaba. And then comes the later period. So many luminaries, as if you have a light that gets diffused because of the scattering you see going out into, into the vacuum, going off like this. Then comes the period of Tabi Tabi'in and people, people after that. Look at the life of Imam Abu Hanifa. What a wonderful man he was. Now people call him the Al Imam Al Azam. Alhamdulillah, he deserves the title. Not many youngsters know that he was at the same time a great scientist. He was the town planner. He was the founder who laid the foundation of Baghdad al Sharif, a city that now stands destroyed. He was the founder in the year 760. He was the one who understood and established the principle of standards. You know, we have ASTM standards and this standard, that standard, without a standard, you can't do anything. Who established? Imam Abu Hanifa was the first one who established it. He was the one who established the principle of dialectic. People don't know that, for instance, the Hanafi fiqh, which was the first fiqh to come into existence, was not written down by Imam Abu Hanifa. Neither was the fiqh after Imam Malik. He did not write it down. Imam Shafi did have a journal from Damascus. He was the first one to start to document. In any case, coming back to Imam Abu Hanifa, he would divide his students into two groups, give them a, an issue that was brought before him, and say, well, you take this position, you take the opposite position, and until you, through consensus, come back to me, I'm not going to give you a judgment. It was 200 years later that all of this was written down. The man who invented the principle of dialectic, which did not come to Europe until the 19th and the 20th century. And when they took it, they took it and they spoiled it, the Europeans. What I'm trying to communicate to you, my brothers and sisters, is that the education system in Islam, which had its origin in the study of the Quran, remember the following, there's so much to say. When a hadith gets into it, into the oceans, it's, it's impossible to stop. Remember the following. The Quran is the fountain, and faith brings knowledge. Unfortunately, what happens today is that when you talk to people of faith, they say, I believe. Belief is not faith. Faith brings knowledge. Belief may or may not. Or you believe in it, it's not scientific. Certainty of faith is knowledge. That's the foundation of knowledge. These people had their foundation, their, their, their feet on the ground with the Quran <coughs> and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And therefore, they with authority, with confidence, could face the nations of the East and the West. I'm not talking about military confrontation. I'm talking about ideal idea confrontations. They took what was good from India. They took what was good from Iran. They took what was good from Egypt, from Africa, from yeah, Yunnan. That's, uh, the Mediterranean area, incorporated it, amalgamated it, and created a civilization that was the marvel of the world for 500 years. Such was the extent of education, the type of education. And how was it disseminated those days? It was from a sheikh to a murid. Murid comes from the word murad, one who is seeking. Unfortunately, each one of these words has become so corrupted these days, when you talk to people, so oh, you're a murid, oh my goodness, whatever. But muri is a beautiful word. So a sheikh would sit in a halakha and he would teach what he had learned either from the prophet or if he was a tabi tabi'in, what he had learned from the tabi'in and such was the dissemination of knowledge. So now we come back to the year 1080. After that you see the beginning of structure in the dissemination of knowledge, the establishment of the university in Baghdad. And of course, Al-Azhar had already been established in the year 969 by the Fatimids. It was already in existence. And these two colleges competed with each other. They competed in the teachings, they competed in the philosophy, they competed in their approach. Just for instance, these days, if you're a technical man, 
Harvard and Stanford, for instance, sometimes compete, or Caltech and MIT compete, or other universities. There was competition in these universities. Then came the later periods. You had the invasions from the West, the, the uh, Crusades, and at the same time, the invasions from the East, which was the Mongols, about the same time, and that classical civilization is destroyed. And out of the ashes of this destruction, you find the ebullience of spiritual energy in Islam. The spirituality that came down to us from the Prophet in the Quran finds its expression in the 13th and 14th century. Not only did it save the day, it converted the Mongols so that they themselves, who were the destroyers of Islamic civilization, became the, the flag bearers of the Islamic civilization. Baraka Khan, in the year 1252, goes to a seminary in Tashkent and Bukhara, learns there, becomes a Muslim. He was not a Muslim. The word Khan is not, a, not an Arabic word. You all know that. It is a Mongol word. It came to, to the subcontinent from the Tatars later. The Tatars are not the same as the Mongols. That's a different story. So you see the ebullience of this spiritual energy expressing itself through such greats as Abdul Qadir Jilani of Baghdad, Sheikh Shaduli of Cairo, and later on in, in North Africa. There are so many names that come to you at the same time. In India and Pakistan later, to Khaja Admiri, and in Indonesia. So not only did the spirituality of Islam save the day, it carried the message of Islam to where it had not reached before namely to the Indian subcontinent, to the Malay Peninsula, which includes Indonesia and Malaysia, to Eastern China, to some portions of Vietnam, to Sub-Saharan Africa, to Europe. Eastern Europe was, it had so much Islamic influence, unfortunately, the last 200 years, because of other reasons, it has receded. It carried the day. Then comes the period which was the year 1683. Very seldom in human history do you find a single date when human civilization takes a turn from one to the other. What happened in 1683? And I've shared this with you in the past. Three very important things happened that year. Number one, Newton published his laws. That was the time, that was the date when he published it. Number two, the Ottoman armies having suffered the defeat after the second siege of Vienna, receded, or never able to recover from it. And the third thing was the promulgation of the Futuhat in India by Aurangzeb Alamgir. Islamic civilization, which was focused on the learning of the spirituality that they had inherited from the Prophet, passed on through the Sahaba, Tabin, Tabinabi, and the great ulama, took a turn towards outward observations. Putu what? What is the fatwa? What is the legal opinion? Legalistic Islam. There's nothing right or wrong. I'm trying to just bring to your attention what happened. So this legalistic Islam was the one that came face to face with the mercantile thrust of the Europeans in the 17th and the 18th century and the tussle lost out in the process of both Asia and Africa became colonized. Then comes the period when the Muslims wake up finally and they say, well, we have to do something about it. Some of them said, we have to learn from the West. That's when you see the, the emergence of institutions such as the Aligarh University in India and some of the universities in the Middle East and then also the change in syllabus, even in institutions such as in Al-Azhar. So you see, education in Islam has gone through transformations. And today, in this day and age, we have to ask ourselves, how can we adopt ourselves to what is going on in the world in terms of technology? Because technology changes people, cultures, <coughs> continents. What does it mean to teach in an age when a teacher is not a teacher, he's a robot? What does it mean to teach a child in a day when people learn through digital technology, not through books? What does it mean to watch a tube and learn from it? Do you learn from it? 
What does it mean to be human in this age? So we have to come to terms with it. My appeal to all of us in here is to be open and ask ourselves what modalities can be adopted so that we retain the core, the teaching of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. And I have emphasized again and again, there is, if there is nothing else that you take back from this podcast, please study the Quran. Teach your children the Quran. That's your basic, that's your source. It is all there. You don't have to read books about the Quran. You don't have to read books about history. You don't have to read books about what other people did. Read the Quran. Read the Sunnah of the Prophet Adopt it in a way that would make it possible for you to retain the core, to retain your Islamic faith based upon the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, <coughs> while at the same time adopting the technology so that you rise up and occupy your place, deserved place, among the nations of the world. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulil Kareem. It's a vast subject, the acquisition of knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge, and uh, volumes have been written about it. There's no one single solution, but we have to be open. We have to look at the life of Omar Abdul Khattab. If he was alive, in my opinion, he would have adopted the best technology available in the world. Because look what he did. He heard of the windmills, he adopted the technology. He heard of the <coughs> documentation that went on in the Persian Empire, he adopted it. Not only that, he hired Persian scribes, writers, because many Arabs, they were, well, they were very good in allocution and, and presentation, verbal presentation, but writing was not a discipline very common. So he would have been open, he would have adopted it. Similarly, you have to look at the life. Secondly, this is the month of Muharram, alhamdulillah. Most young people do not know who started the, the uh, Islamic calendar. It was Hazrat Omar al He was the originator of the Islamic calendar, although Muharram, as the first month of the Islamic calendar was established by the Prophet himself. People used to be happy at the time, the onset of the year. Fasting on the ninth day and the tenth day, following the Sunnah of the Prophet it's, 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 it's the time to do. Those of you who can fast, do fast. And most importantly, my brothers and sisters, this is the time when we should address the issues also that divide us. So many times when I talk to my colleagues, the issue of, well, the Shias do this, the Sunnis do this comes up. Remember, Islam is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. What came later is history. It is okay to have difference in opinion and history. It is okay to discuss history. Isn't it time after 1500 years? 1500 years, isn't it time to bury the gap that divides the Shia and the Sunni? A gap that is exploited by those who don't wish as well? If you don't believe me, look at the Middle East. Look at what is happening in the world today. Isn't it time we got together? on the basis of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. I appeal to you, this is a very august gathering, highly educated, very capable people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed with knowledge and wealth and capability and security. This is the place to start. So inshallah, we may start from this area. Let's Recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ibn Inna Allahu malaika tahu salluna ala nabi ya ayuha al-ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu kasiba Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu mahim Let us pray Bismillah ar-Rahman ibn Allahumma insra nasa khadija وافتح لنا فتحا قريبا اللهم اجعلنا من لدنك بديا اللهم اجعلنا من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا واكتب السحة والسلامة والعفو والعافية والنسرة علينا وعلى الهجاد والزوار والوزاد والمقيمين والمسافرين في برك وجهرك جوبك من أمة محمد